I love singing that song. It's a song that we need to sing because it reminds us, maybe I'm not as tough as I think I am. Maybe I don't have the plan that I think I have. Maybe I, maybe I need God more than I, I rem remember that I need him. Now, maybe you're better than I am, but on any given day, I get so wrapped up in all the stuff I'm doing, I forget every hour I need you. So we're kicking off a new series this weekend, and it's, it's this idea of, it's called travel plans. It's this idea that God takes every single person on a journey. Now, there's some really cool stories in the Bible of journeys that people have gone on, and I think we would, we would mistakenly sometimes read these stories and say, oh, that's good for them. And what I want you to lean into for the next couple of weeks is I want you to lean into this idea that God has a journey, a trip for you. I truly believe that if you read the Bible, you will come to understand that God has a plan specifically for you. Stop thinking about other people. Don't worry about how, what everybody else to say. Okay, God, what do you have for me? What step would you have me take? I believe he designed you specifically to go on a journey that's unique to you that nobody else will go on. The question is, are you willing to trust him? and take this journey. Some of you already feel it. You know God's calling you to do something, but you don't know what it is. You know that there's more to this life than what you've been living for. There's more than, than what you have planned, but you don't know what to do with it. You don't know how to respond. Let me read you the story of maybe one of the greatest, maybe one of the greatest journeys that somebody ever went on for the impact it had on his life. This weekend, we're gonna study a man named Abraham, but before he even got his name changed to Abraham, it was Abram, and he had to go on a journey, both literal and spiritual. Now watch this, Genesis chapter 12, verse one. The Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, leave your relatives, leave your father's family, basically leave everything that's comfortable and nice and feels familiar to you and go to a land that I will show you. Not a land that you know, go somewhere that I don't e you don't even know what it is. I I'll give it to you later, just start walking. Really God? And then God promises him this, I'm gonna make you into a great nation. I'm gonna bless you, I'm gonna make you famous. I'm, I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna allow you to be a blessing to others. I will bless the people who bless you and I will curse the people who treat you with contempt. All the families on the earth are gonna be blessed through you, Abram. So Abram left, he did what he was told to do. He obeyed as the Lord had instructed and Lot went with him, Lot's his nephew. It says, Abram was 75 years old when he started his journey. I wanna hear any of that crap, I'm too old to take the next step. No, you're not. He just started on his journey at 75, let alone what happens the next couple years to him. It says he leaves, he leaves Haran and in, in, into his household. He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew Lot, all of his wealth, his livestock, all the people that he had taken from his household to Haran. He headed into the land of Canaan, which be, eventually becomes the promised land, by the way. When they arrived in Canaan, Abram traveled through the land as far as Shechem. He set up a camp beside the Oak of Moriah. And at that time, the area was inhabited by Canaanites. That means God called him into hostile territory. God took Abram on a journey into a place that he did not want to go, into a place that was very uncomfortable. And I think some of you, God has taken you through some sadness recently. He's taken you through a, a valley of a shadow of death. He's taken you, or, or maybe he's calling you and you, you're afraid to go because it looks painful. Abram's story will end with this. The Lord appeared to Abram and he said, I'll give you this land for your descendants. And Abram built an altar there and he dedicated to the Lord who had appeared to him. If you were here at the block party last week, I, I had Zach and Mike help me build a big pile of rocks because what we wanted to say is, we want to say, hey, just like in the Old Testament where they built up altars to remember what God had done, we want to make sure that we're intentional about remembering the journeys that God has taken us on. And I can look back and see all the journeys that I've gotten to in, this, in the time that I'm here. I'm a very young man. So I only have a few, but the ones that I have gone through to get to where I am right now, I see that God has, has been faithful in those. And so what I believe he's calling me to do next, and what I believe he's calling us to do next, it's gonna require us to put that same faith in him, have that same trust and say, okay, God, I'm with you. Take me on this trip, take me on a journey. That song we sang said, teach, 
teach my song to rise to you. Why? Because this, as much as I love looking at the story of Abraham, he's a lot more faithful than I am. And I have to be reminded, and sometimes we worship to be reminded that to kind of recalibrate our heart, God, I need more from you. So when a song says, teach my, when it says, teach my song to rise to you, it's just you praying to God saying, God, remind me of how to do this. Keep, keep teaching me, God, how to worship you. When temptation, when it gets heavy and it comes my way, then I'll know that if I can't stand anymore, and maybe you came this weekend and you're going, I don't even know that I can make it through. I don't even know that I got what's coming. I don't have the energy or the brain power or the faith. I don't know that I got it. Then why don't you just remind your heart that when you cannot stand, just fall on him. Collapse into his arms. Maybe that's what he's asking you right now. As the band sings, why don't you sing with them? Remember who it is that you're saying, you're my hope and stay, Jesus. You're all that I need. Teach my song. Come on, church. Come on, make this your prayer. You can sing it with your eyes closed if you want. When I can't stand anymore, God, I'm still going to go forward. When I don't know how to go tomorrow, when I don't know how to get there, you're, you're my hope and stay. God, everything I need comes from you. When I can't do it, I'll fall on you. Why? Because I got a hope. And I'm trusting you. Make it your prayer. Come on. Tell him, God, I know I need you and I need only you. God, right now, Lord, we need you. Whatever journey you're calling us on, God, we can't do it without you. Lord, every minute, every hour, every step, I need you. The only thing I got working for me, God, is you. Oh, God, how I need you. Lord, how I need you. Come on, one more time. Close your eyes and make it a prayer. Lord, every hour. I need you. The only thing I got, God, that righteousness from you, oh Lord. I need you today, God. Church, will you join me in prayer? If you would just bow your head and close your eyes. As I pray out loud, would you maybe, maybe pray quietly right where you're standing and say, Lord, I give you permission to take me on a journey. God, I... I I ask you, Lord, to open my heart and my mind. Take me on a trip where I can be more of the man, the woman that you created me to be. God, I'm saying yes right now. I want to go forward. I want to know what you have for me. God, I need more purpose. I need more direction. God, I need you. Lord, help. God, I ask that you would help each and every one of us here. Lord, that this weekend would be a weekend where we learn to trust you. We learn to admit that we need you more than we need anything else. God, I ask that we would fall on you. And Lord, I ask that your word would become quick and powerful and it would pierce our hearts this, this weekend. As we, as we read a story about Abraham, God, I ask that you would make it personal to us so that we would know what you're calling us to do. God, would you take us on this journey and would you help us see all that you've called us to be? We ask this, we pray this in your very special, very precious, very holy name. Amen. Thank you, church. You can be seated. Make a little noise. I want to know you're ready to go on a trip with me. I want to know if you guys are ready for what it is that I think God is going to be telling us this weekend. I'm stoked that you're with me. Thank you for being here. If you're watching right now online, if you tuned in on, on YouTube or Facebook or you're listening to this on the podcast, man, thank you guys for joining us as well. Um, I, I, hope, I hope you know just how much I appreciate the opportunity to preach to you. Last week was wicked special for us, the block party. I want to say a big thank you. One, you guys were very honoring, and that was, man, that, that just touched my heart. Two, 
Uh, you guys showed up, man. You showed up in a big way. You served our community. That was awesome to see all of these people come together, all the food you cooked. I mean, a lot of food. I love that. And all the people that were just drawn to. I had so many people uh, in just this last week telling me, man, that was, that was my first experience at Harbor, or I brought a friend and it was their first experience. Man, what a great testimony. Just, just to be known as a church that loves the community, pours into the community. Yeah, you guys should make some noise for that. You'll be proud of that. On that same note, that's why uh, when she talked about earlier in the announcement, she talked about that golf tournament coming up. I'd like you guys to just make a special prayer request for that. That has nothing to do with Harbor. That We get nothing out of that. We are going to spend money. I was going to say we're going to lose money on that. We don't lose it. We're investing that in our community. That, that is going to help a lot of the local veterans and some that are struggling there. Um, it's a great way for us as a church to bless our community. So if you can even kind of play golf, sign up, get a team in that. And if you're like, I have zero desire or availability to play golf, maybe you can donate to that, to that uh, fund. Once again, Harbor gets nothing out of that, uh, but you could donate something that could, we could raffle off. You might know somebody who could do that and help out. It's a great cause. Just really put that on your, on your radars. It's only a couple weeks away. I think it's another great opportunity for our church to invest in our community. We want to be known for what we give, not what we take. Now, on that note, let me talk to you guys about why I'm up here with a bag on and I'm bringing this. And you're like, oh, cool props for this weekend's uh, message. Yeah, but I just got off a plane. I was, I was out of state at a conference, just trying to learn how to be a better pastor. You know, I need all the help I can get. So those conferences, got to get a lot of them. Uh, they, uh, the, it got over this morning. I flew out, was flying to get back here as quick as I can. So I didn't have time to empty these out. These are filled with my dirty laundry. <laughs> so <laughs> welcome. Yeah, it's a cool prop. Um, it's real, real. Uh, and we'll talk about baggage later on in this series. But I, I want to talk about traveling. I want to talk about this idea of going on a trip. Uh, and I get to travel a lot. Um, and what I've learned is that, uh, and what I've noticed, I guess is a better way to say it, is that the people who get to board the plane before me, that list keeps getting longer and longer now. It used to just be like, oh, you know, first class can go. Or then it was like, now first class and like anybody with disabilities. And then it's all the service people. And then it's like literally anybody who's ever like, you know, had a birthday in February. And then it's like all the kids. And then it's like, like now, then it's like our Miles Plus program. And then it's our gold members and our silver members and our platinum members. And, and anybody not named Josh. <laughs> Might be because I'm cheap. I don't know. But I was sitting there and I was like, uh, I was like, can I board the plane yet? And she's like, are you a platinum member? I'm like, I don't know. And she's like, if you don't know what it is, you're not a platinum member. <laughs> Forget you. She's like, oh, your name's Josh Adams? Oh, you're the poop member. That's the brown class right down there. This is gold and silver and platinum. Uh, that's not completely true, but that's how I feel. That's how I feel. And I struggle because like it's it's a tough it's tough traveling like this. And people are like, oh, you're not one of those people that stand up when the plane lands. Stop giving me crap about standing up when the plane lands. Only short people say that. <laughs> I don't pay for the extra big seat, so I sit like this for three hours. I'm almost six three, and they make that seat for I don't know a four year old. So yeah, I stand up when the plane lands. Now I don't clap when the plane lands. If you do that, you're weird. Okay, <laughs> don't do that. Any, I don't know what that has to do with it. Oh. So I realized that I'm not a platinum member. Uh, and when it comes to traveling, I've, I've found that the people who travel well, the platinum members of this world, the people who get it, they, they get the free check bag, they get the, the, the free champagne on the, on the flight, they get the board early, they get the comfy seats. Those people who know how to travel well, they, they, have, they have figured out this is the way to do it. You know, in the Bible, there's a version of that when it comes to a journey of faith. The, the Bible has, in Hebrews chapter 11, it has what's called the Hall of Fame of Faith. And it lists a whole bunch of people there. And here's the thing about each of the people that are listed in the Hall of Faith. It's men and women who have figured out how to travel on this spiritual journey that God takes us on. They figured out how to travel well. They reached platinum status or whatever, you're, you know, whatever company it is, you know, extra miles, whatever, sky miles, whatever it is. They've reached it because of their faith in God. I just told you about Abraham's story. The original story, as it happened, was in Genesis. Well, over a couple thousand years later, you have it recorded in the book of Hebrews about how that went down. Abraham was the beginning of the Jewish nation. The, the Hebrews didn't exist. The Jewish people, the nation of Israel didn't exist. And out of nowhere, 
out of, out of a whole bunch of nobodies, God picked a guy named Abram and said, hey, you, you're a nobody that I want to turn into a somebody. If you'll trust me, I'm going to take you on a journey and I'll make you into a great nation. I'll take this old 75-year-old man with his old 75-year-old wife and I'm going to take them and, and I'm going to give them descendants that are innumerable. And I'm going to use them. He said, I'll use you to bless the whole world because God said, my plan is to create through you this whole lineage of people and I'm going to tell their story and I'm going to show their ups and downs and how broken they are and, and how much I love them. And I'm going to use that to paint a picture to the whole world. And when Abraham eventually has a son named Isaac, Isaac has a son named Jacob and he gets his name changed to Israel and he has 12 sons and they make up the 12 tribes of Israel. And then Years and years and years and years down the road, God sends his son, Jesus, to be born from the tribe of Judah, which is one of those 12 boys, and he is the Messiah for the whole world. God knew that plan thousands of years before it happened. He goes all the way back and he says, Abraham, I want to do something in you. And Abraham said, yes. This is how it's recorded in the Hall of Fame of Faith. I want you to pay attention, okay? Watch this. It was by faith, Hebrews eleven eight says, that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and to go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. Oh, all the control freaks in the room just got a little nervous, didn't you? <laughs> We're going to be talking about that this weekend. He went without knowing where he was going, and even when he reached the land that God had promised him, he still, even when he said yes, he still had to keep saying yes to God and live by faith when he got there. Remember, it was filled with Canaanites. That means he was not very welcome. Those were the bad guys. It was, he was like a foreigner living in tents. God didn't let him set down roots. He kept moving. It's almost like God just kept moving him from one experience to the next, keeping him out of his comfort zone. Okay, all right. And he did the same thing with Isaac and with Jacob, and that's his son and his grandson, who had inherited the same promise, that one I read to you from Genesis. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed by God. What's that mean? It means he wasn't worried about his own castle and what he could build here on earth. He had a vision much bigger than his castle. He had a kingdom vision. What does God want for me? What's, what can my life be used for that has eternal value? It was by faith that Sarah, that's his wife, was actually able to have a child even though she had been barren for decades and she was way too old by normal standards. It was miraculous, but she believed that God would keep his promise and so he did and she had a kid. And so a whole nation came from this one man that was as good as dead. A nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand and the seashore, there's no way to count them. Now, I need you guys to understand what it is that God called him to do. If you remember what I read while we were singing, what I read from Genesis, he says, leave, leave this, this area, leave your family, leave your friends, leave civilization. Now, that may not be a big deal to some of you, but you guys can understand thousands of thousands, this is almost 5,000 years ago. Civilization was the only way that you survived. The earth was hard to live on. It was largely uninhabited, minus a few major cities in Egypt and Ur of the Chaldees. And Haran. There was not a lot of major gathering points, but those points were what kept people alive because if you left the safety of those, those areas, you were in no man's land and it was very, the nomadic culture there was very barbaric. A lot of bandits and thieves and wild animals and you just didn't live outside of those areas. And God's like, yeah, that's where I want you to go. Did you also notice that God said, go to a place I'll give you? He didn't say go here. He just said, start walking that way. I don't know if you've ever gotten a car and you're like, I'm just going to drive. Sometimes I do that, honestly. I'm like, dear God, I'm just going to drive until I feel better. And then I end up in like, you know, New Hampshire or something. And I'm like, I got to go home. Uh, I'm just kidding. Being a pastor is great. Um, the... The idea there is that he's speaking to this, this problem that you and I have when it comes to our spiritual journeys. God says, hey, I've got something for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull you to another level. You're not quite the man or the woman I created you to be yet. I've got a step for you to take. You guys feel that. You know it. 
And you're going, okay, so what am I supposed to do? Whatever it is he's going to call you to do, it's going to require a couple things. You go like this. God, what do you want me to do? You want me to do that? Okay, well, here, here's, here's my bags. I'm packed, <laughs> ready to go. What, what do you got there? Uh, this, um, this is all the things that are going to keep me comfortable. <laughs> this is the stuff that makes me feel good, the things that <laughs> who allow me to not, not get all wrapped up. These are the things that are just, oh, can't live without them. <laughs> I don't know if any of you ever traveled with somebody like that. You're like, it's a one day. Why is our car filled with five bags? You don't know what we don't have. <laughs> Some of you, you just need comfort, don't you? Some of you are like, happy to go, but whew, I need it to be when I want to leave, where I want to go, how I want to go. I want the temperature to be the exact temperature. I need it to last just the amount of, amount of time. I don't want a long flight. I don't want any layovers. I don't, it's, See, as long as I have control, <laughs> I'm happy to go. <laughs> yeah, I know this is triggering for some of you. Because you just heard me say that God said, start walking, and I'm not going to tell you the end. And you went, you can't go on a trip without knowing where you're going. You can't, you can't do that. I need to know the mileage. And I need, I need, to, have, I need to have rest stops planned. Some of you control freaks have been saying no to God so much because he's telling you, I'm not going to give you the answers, but I still expect your obedience. And you're going, you're standing there with your bags packed going, as soon as you let me go with all my luggage. And he goes, oh no, you get no carry-ons on this trip. <laughs> now I'm going to speak in another, in another service in a couple of weeks on some of the baggage that you got to let go of. But if we even want to talk about you starting a trip, make this note, you can't pack comfort and control on your spiritual journey. You got to say, here's all the things that make me comfortable. Part of faith says I can't stay, I can't grow in my faith and stay in my comfort zone, so I got to leave comfort at home. And oh, here it is, control, where I make the decisions. See, this is why some of you don't have faith, is because you cannot surrender you will not grow on a spiritual journey. You will not grow in a walk with God if you have to stay comfortable because you don't grow in your comfort. And you will not grow in your spiritual walk if you have to be the one who calls all the shots. I'm willing to surrender to God. To God, I want to be led. Lead me, Lord, on the days that I want to be led, in the direction that I want to be led, at the pace that I want to be led, at the time that I want to be led, for the amount, the duration that I want to be led, and only in ways that don't make me feel uncomfortable. Maybe you're the God of your life then. That doesn't sound like a surrendered servant. Pastor, how do you know that? Just look at how you prayed. If you prayed today... There's a good chance that your prayer was, dear God, I want this, I need this. Could you do this? Please, 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 give me, give me, give me. At no point did you say today, God, what do you have for me? It's a yes, whatever you give me, whatever direction, even if I can't see how it works out, even if I don't understand where it's going, even if I can't see the end result, I'm going to blindly follow you. I will trust you instead of having to be in control of all of this. This is why Proverbs 19, verse 21 says this, you can make many plans, and most of us do, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. This is Solomon saying, as much as you like to think you're in control, you gotta understand, ultimately all that matters is what God wants, so why don't you just stop trying to force what you want all the time and just surrender to it? You'd be a lot happier. You'd have a lot less anxiety as a boss, as a spouse, as a parent, as a student, if you would just understand, this is all in God's hands anyways. I'm not saying be lazy. I'm not saying be, act like an idiot and throw caution to the wind. But I am saying stop, stop trying to pack control everywhere you go and then being wonder, wondering why God doesn't want to bring you on a journey. It's like, no, no, no baggage allowed. At least not that kind. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 says this. Don't worry about all that stuff. Stop worrying about where the next rest stop is and you know, how, how, many, how many hotels are along the way and can you get a good Yelp review restaurant to eat at because you don't want to eat fast food. Stop worrying about what we will eat and what we will drink and what we will wear and where we will go and what the roadside attractions are. Stop worrying about all of the stuff on the journey. Why? Because being consumed about that stuff, these kind of things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. 
But if you're here and you claim that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then you have a heavenly father and he already knows all your needs. Can you imagine my kids got in my car and they're like, yeah, I can't wait for this road trip. But daddy, I think you need to put the key in like this and turn it like that. And then you need to take it from 73 degrees down to 72 degrees. Then you need to put it in reverse and back it out of the driveway. And then you need to head down the highway. And you need to get on the one that says going north. <clears throat> no, my kids don't do that. But can you imagine if they did? <clears throat> Maybe you haven't realized that as your father, I already know this. And as your father, I might have a plan that's a little bit more involved than what you realize. And by the way, I don't need you. I'm allowing you to come on this journey because I want to develop you. I want you to have some great experiences. Now, see, as I, I grew up as a missionary kid, which means I traveled the United States speaking at churches, or my dad did, and I went with them, and I got to see, I've seen every United States. I've been at all of them. I just saw them from the back of a station wagon looking backwards. So I knew where we had come from. I saw everything as we left it, but I got to see them all. But I saw some great things. I mean, Mount Rushmore, Grand Canyon, all that stuff. I mean, I've been everywhere, seen it all. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm a rambling man kind of thing. It's that, it's that all the places that I got to go to were because my, my dad, my father, allowed me to be a part of the journey. If I try to do it in my own power, I, I had no clue. I'm just a kid. And spiritually, as much as you think you know how good you think you can drive the car that is your life, it may just be that you got to start trusting your father a little bit more. You got to let go. See, we all want to walk on the water, but Peter never got to walk on the water till he let go of the boat. Some of you, until you learn to release these bags, you are not going to go on this trip. So start there. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 says, We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. Some of you ain't got no endurance. You quit at everything. You, you can't make it to things getting tough because you have to be in control. You have to be comfortable. And so you have no endurance in your life. Spiritual endurance, you ain't got it. The second the day starts to go slightly not perfectly your way, you lose your testimony, you lose your faith in God, you lose everything that is supposed to be good. You start cussing people out, you start getting grumpy, you can't talk to your spouse without just going off, you can't be around your parents or your kids, you can't go to work. When things aren't your way, because you haven't developed endurance, because you haven't learned to let go, the slightest problem to your trip makes you cancel it. I'll pull this car over right now, and you do. Literally all the time. I'm going to make a lot of these dad jokes, so but get on board, okay? You, you need to develop endurance. When you develop endurance, the next verse says, endurance helps you develop strength of character. You want to know why you keep falling for all of those sins that you keep falling for? You want to know why you're guilty of doing the things that you know you shouldn't do? You're, you're sad about it. You regret it but you don't have the character to withstand it because you haven't gotten the endurance to make it through it and you don't have the endurance because you have not gone on the journey that God's called you on. If you have the strength of character, the strength of character strengthens your confident hope of salvation. That hope you're missing out on, that's why some of you, you ain't got no hope. You watch the news and you immediately start to stress. You think about your finances and you immediately become filled with anxiety. You look at your health or your kids or your love life or whatever it is, and you immediately begin to worry. You don't have hope when it comes to this world because you haven't gone on the journey of being developed, and you can't be developed with the character and the endurance to become the man or woman that God wants you to be because it will be outside of your comfort zone, and you have got to have comfort or else you don't do it because we live in a spoiled country with a spoiled mentality where if everything doesn't go my way, then I'm out. And that is what's the problem with Christianity today is that we will not take a journey because it's slightly uncomfortable, slightly out of our control, slightly inconvenient. And then God's sitting there going, how do you expect me to grow you when you won't do anything tough? And this is why we struggle. Now, 
there is a part to this where you do kind of have to understand, even if you let go of some of it, you still have, let's just call them regulations. Has anybody noticed that when you travel, the rules keep changing? TSA, if you work for TSA, God has grace. Don't worry about it. Fall under the mercy. Um, But TSA, they can't even figure out what they believe. They don't know what their rules are. I was in Boston, and this lady was yelling at us, take all of your electronics out of your bag. Make sure all your electronics are out of your bag. And then I get up to the line, and they have them. She's like, are your electronics out of your bag? And I'm like, I'm one foot away from you. You don't have to scream at me like, there's my laptop. There's my cell phone. I took them out. Dude next to me forgot one. He had his laptop out, but he forgot some type of cord or something. And she was like, your electronics have to be out of your bag. And I was like, dude, you're in trouble. It's like, I'm not with him. I'm not with him. I'm like just moving on my own way. No lie. The next airport I was in to fly back home, leave all your electronics in your bag. Some dude took his laptop out. The dude yelled at him. Why is this out of your bag? You're slowing everything down. Keep it in your bag. Keep your electronics in your bag. And I'm like, what, what is it, TSA? In, out, one, yes, no, electronics. Like, <laughs> Am I the only one that just struggles with rules? I'm trying to figure them out. I'm trying to understand what rule it is I'm supposed to do today. You see, I'm trying to obey. I'm trying to obey I put all my shampoos in little bottles. I threw my water out. Don't want to have this much shampoo, only this much shampoo, because you know that'll change things. And why? I better not bring my free water in. I have to buy that $8 bottle of water because that's important. Now, whatever, I know. Don't come at me. I know. I'm just joking. But, oh, by the way, if you understand how TSA works and how much it's changed... Uh, when I, my senior year of high school, I was working for a pipe fitting company, and uh, this is 1999, so like this is before 9-11, and if you don't remember a time before 9-11, you're too young for this story, um, <laughs> but this is, this is before 9-11, so air, let me just say, airports were a lot cooler back then, <laughs> a lot easier. Uh, I worked for a pipe fitting company, but it was a big company. We also had HVAC that was there. And so we did a lot of, uh, you know, making air conditioning, uh, you know, air conditioning ducts, like duct work and stuff. So it's real thin metal. And our boss, the foreman was going on a trip. He had to fly somewhere. Some of the guys in the shop took a, a sheet of the metal and they, they did an outline of a gun, like a perfect outline of a gun. And then they sliced the lining of the inside of his briefcase and slid it in the lining of his briefcase so that when you open it, you don't see it. But when you close it and you go through the metal detector, they're like watching it. And there's this handgun that shows up on the, on, the, uh, on the briefcase and they look at it and then they come in, they take all this crap out and it goes back through and it's still on there. And then they pull, they pull them into like a back room and like... <laughs> After he finally figured it out and pulled it out, they, they had a good laugh about it. They wouldn't laugh about it today. Don't, that is not me saying to do it. Back then, it was really funny. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know why I told you that. <laughs> it was just a fun story. Um, the rules, though, the part of it I was, I was trying to talk about was these rules. This obeying, you have to obey if you want to travel. It's true today in, in a very unfortunate way, but it's also true spiritually. And here's why we struggle, because we don't like the obedience part of following God. And what you're thinking right now is, see, I knew it. If I have God in my life, there's all these things I can't do. No, 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 no. The only difference between going to heaven or going to hell is embracing the forgiveness that Jesus Christ offered you on the cross when he died in your place. If you surrender and have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's, that's it. All of the things outside of that is just how you grow to look more like Jesus. And what he's done is he's created what you think of as rules, but what I'm telling you are guardrails because they help you know where the path is. And if you've ever driven and you go off road, you don't go as far. The guardrails keep you on the road. The road is paved so you can go further faster. But if you disobey the boundaries... You're going to get flat tires, and you're going to wreck your car, and the path isn't as clear. And some of you look like you're like, a lot of, a lot of you spiritually are off-roaders right now. <laughs> like, I just want to do my own thing. Yeah, that's called disobedience. <laughs> Write this down. Your spiritual velocity 
is going to be dictated by the speed and frequency of your obedience. What's velocity? That's how far you can go, how fast you can go doing it. The journey of your spiritual development, the velocity, the, the, how far and how fast you can do that will be determined by how frequently, how often, and how quickly you say yes to God. Your obedience is, is like, think of it this way. Your obedience is like a car that God has given you on the highway of spiritual development. And every time you say yes, you're putting gas in that car. Now, you might be sitting here going, well, I don't have to because I've, uh, I've kind of done what I like and I'm still making progress. Okay. God's called you to go cross country on this journey to grow in a relationship with him. And he's given you a car to do it. And you're walking and you're patting yourself on the back that you made three miles today. But if you had just been in the car that he gave you, you would have made 300 miles today. Stop being so proud of you doing it in your own power. You are so far away from what it is that God's called you to be. You would be so much more the man or the woman that God had designed you to be if you would just learn obedience. Yes, Lord, what do you have for me? Have you ever seen somebody who ran out of gas and had to push their car? You ever seen that? That look, have you ever had to do that? That sucks. You are not making the progress that you should be. Stop telling me about the one time this week that you decided to do what God called you to. I was obedient. You know that, you know that they say statistically you make at least 3,000 decisions in a week? Stop telling me about the, two, about the one time. You're like, uh, now, I technically disobeyed 2,999 times. But there's one. Where, oh, you put one little bit of gas in your car. No wonder you're not getting where God's called you to go. You know how much slower it is pushing the car than riding in the car? Do you know how much further you would be in, in your journey? I, I'm not saying this to pick on you. I'm saying this, please learn from my mistakes. The sooner, the quicker you say yes to God, the better you will be on this development. And if you're like, well, I've already said a bunch of no's. Abraham was 75 when he first, first started saying yes. So you're not too far gone. He was 75 when he said his first yes, and God has been using, God used him like crazy, and look what he did through him. But you gotta learn how to say yes. This is where uh, Psalms 119, verse 30, I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I set your rules before me. The choice I've made is to say yes to you, and that means I'll even embrace the rules. I'll stay inside the guardrails. Does God still love you if you go off road? Yes. Will God still forgive you? Yes. Are there consequences for disobedience? Yes. You want to know why some of your marriages suck? Because God gave you guardrails for how to act as a husband and wife, but you want to go drive on your own path. You want to know why your personal life is a struggle? Because he gave you guardrails, and you said, well, I'd rather do my own thing. He gave you guardrails for your finances. He gave you guardrails for your health. He gave you guardrails for how to act at work. He gave you guardrails for how to interact with those annoying family members. He gave you guardrails on all that, and you keep doing what you want to do, and then you're wondering why you're not making progress and why that stuff is so tough. And he's like, this isn't my best for you. You're off in a field, and I paved a highway. Yeah. And you're like, oh, woe is me. God doesn't love me. And it's not that God doesn't love you. It's that you don't listen. Yeah. And you suck at directions. All right, whatever. First Peter 1, verse 14. You must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. Back then, you didn't know any better. All those mistakes you made before you knew God, yeah, you didn't know any better. But now you do know better. You do have a heavenly father, and you're supposed to obey. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. Your goal is to look more like Jesus, not like the old you. The old you did whatever you wanted, and the old you kept ending up in ditches with a car that was on fire. The new you was supposed to be looking like Jesus. Stop saying yes to all the dumb stuff that you used to. Start saying yes to God. Stop disobeying. By the way, delayed obedience is disobedience. Well, I'm going to do it. One day, I'm going to start tithing. One day, I'm going to start loving my neighbor. One day, I'll start serving. One day, I'll, I'll learn to forgive. One... That is disobedience until you say yes and start doing it. Right. Knowing what you're supposed to do and then not doing it, for whatever excuse you've got, it's still disobedience. 
Luke 11 says this in verse 28. More blessed, this is Jesus talking. These are the words of Christ. Even more blessed are the people who hear the word of God and put it into practice. The book of James says, don't just be hearers of the word, be doers only. Well, I came to church. I, I got a message. I checked the box. Well, aren't you just this great person? That's like sitting in your car with a road map going, going on an amazing trip. No, bro, you ain't started the car, but I'm imagining how good it'll be. Yeah, you ain't going nowhere. You're sitting in a car with a road map, but you're not doing anything with it. You might, you might read your Bible a lot. You might come to church a lot. You check all the boxes that religion taught you to check. Like if you're a good enough person, I just do, I just do good stuff and don't do bad stuff. And I just, I just love God and I, I try, try to help old ladies across the street. And I just, if I'm just good, I'll get there. No, you're not. You have to have a relationship with Christ a personal relationship, not one that your parents gave you, not one that your spouse has for you. You have to have your own walk with God, and then you have to start obeying him if you want to make progress in looking more like Jesus. Now, you might be sitting there going, well, I am obeying. You're not. When you learn to obey in the little things, God will give you opportunities to grow in the big areas. When you obey and say yes in the ordinary, God will give you a chance to grow in the extraordinary. When you learn to stand up and fight the lion or the bear, God will give you a chance to kill a giant. But he goes in those kind of orders. It's, it's taking trips that are easy before you take trips that are hard. You ever see a 16-year-old get their license? I got my license. I'm ready. I'm ready. I want to drive down to Florida. Now, how about you go to Stop and Shop first <laughs> and get back without anything? And we'll talk about expanding the territory that you're allowed to drive to. Do you guys understand how it works? God's the same way. He's like, he goes, I want to trust you with more, but I need you to trust me. So you can write this down. The more you trust God, the more he'll trust you. As I learn to trust God and say yes to him, and he grows my territory, then he'll, he'll start to allow me to experience more territory. This is the same thing happens with, uh, with Abraham. Abraham leaves his home. He goes and he travels on this journey, learns to trust God, and God eventually gives him a son. And he promises him that this son is how he's going to have descendants that outnumber the sand on the seashore. But then after he has his one and only son, Isaac, God says, hey, I want you to take Isaac up to the top of this mountain and kill him. Sacrifice him. And you would say, that sounds really like a bad God. God didn't really want Isaac to be sacrificed. What God wanted to do is he wanted to paint a picture using Abraham and his only son, Isaac, for everybody who read the story after it that one day God would send his only begotten son to climb the hill of Golgotha where he would sacrifice him as the payment for sin for everybody else. He just wanted to show Abraham's faithfulness to that and then show how God actually did it. But that heartache that you must have seen or you would feel reading the story of Abraham having to kill Isaac, I, Abraham gets mentioned two times in the Hall of Fame of Faith. He gets mentioned because he left and went on the journey to 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 start being the patriarch of, of the Israelite nation. He also gets mentioned again, if you go back to the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 17, it says, and mentions him again, it says, it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice to God when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promise, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is, is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham just reasoned that if Isaac died, God would bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead because he thought, okay, I'm losing my son today, but God will bring him back to life. God actually stops Abraham before he kills him. He says, like, I just wanted to, I wanted to see your faith in me, Abraham. I wanted to test you and to see that. And here's the thing about God expanding our territories. When he can trust us with a little, he'll start to trust us with more. To whom much is given, much will be required. To who's faithful with a little will be given a chance to be faithful with much. Stop asking God for a mountaintop experience when you won't obey the basic ba baby steps to get to base camp. Don't tell me how you want to slay giants when you won't say yes to the lions and bears. 
Don't tell me how you were ready to walk on water when you won't say yes to getting out of the boat. God says, I will let you grow on this journey and I will take you on on to bigger and bigger things, but I'm not going to do that if you're not willing to say yes on the basics. How do I know you're not doing it? Because God said, listen, if you wanna have this great marriage, stop sleeping with people that you aren't married to right now and you won't do that because you know it's fun, and you, you like to do things your way, because you're in control, and so you don't obey in the basics. God says, hey, be open-handed with your money, be generous, tithe, and give back, and see what it's like to be radically generous to people outside of you. You won't do that, because you know you gotta be in control. It's about how your plan is, and you know money's tight, and you got your own budget. God says, hey, I want you to forgive that person who hurt you, and you said, no, it's about me and how I feel, and I hate that person, so the bitterness needs to stay with me, and you won't obey him on the basic thing. You, God says, listen, I want you to actually step outside of your comfort zone and give me some of your time to go love on this person and be, and be, a, be a, a ministry in, in their life. And you say, no, no, I don't have time for that. I have my own agenda. Don't tell me how you want a mountaintop when you won't do the basic stuff at the bottom. You're not growing under these bigger things because your, your journey, you keep saying no, and you're not taking God on the little stuff. You're never going to get to the big stuff. This is the problem that we have. And this is why we struggle. This is why we are not becoming the man or the woman that God created us to be. It's because Right now, we get a chance, and and we're blowing the little stuff. Stop asking God for the big stuff. He can't trust you with the big stuff. No, no, no. You you don't get to drive the the big car. I can't trust you with the shopping cart at the store right now. (laughs) The the book of, of James says it this way, and I think some of you are like, you know, but it's so tough to climb the mountain. It's so tough to, 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 to stop doing things that I want to do. It's so, it's so tough to put the bottle down or the pills down. They make me feel good. Yeah, you're never going to have the big victory when you're not willing to, to take the battle and the, and the fight for the small victory. And this is what he says in James chapter, uh, James chapter 1, verse 2. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. There's that endurance piece again. When was the last time you thought of it as joy that your road trip had a few speed bumps? When was the last time you thought of it as joy that everything didn't go the way you had planned it? I'm looking at a bunch of faces that look just like mine when I read it. I have a tendency to whine and complain. I don't know that I normally thank God. I don't know that I'm like, oh, yay, something that went against my plans? Super. I'm normally a jerk to be around. And I'm using the nicest words I can think of. Why? Because we don't do the very basics that he says. Count it all joy if your your trip gets a little bit interrupted, if you have a detour or traffic. Why is he saying that? He says, for you know that when your faith is tested, your church has a chance to grow. So let it grow for when your endurance is fully developed, then you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Now, I look around this room and I don't see any people that are perfect and complete. You're like, oh, no, just don't, don't. You don't want the embarrassment that'll come with that, okay? None of us are perfect and complete yet. Why? Because our endurance hasn't been fully developed. Why? Because we haven't let it grow. Why? Because we're not finished with the journey that God has us on. But that sounds tough. Well, yeah, I think I've been very clear that it's tough. I've been trying to be clear because I think you need to know what's going on ahead of time. When I take people on road trips, I tell them all the worst stuff. It's going to be long. I don't make a lot of P-stops, so you're going to have to learn how to hold it. We're going to drive through New York and Connecticut, so you know that'll suck. Nothing but traffic and and construction. Connecticut's always construction. It's never not construction. Like, it'll always be. Like, I'm just, I'm preparing you for the worst so that if you decide to go on the trip, you'll have at least a heads up that it won't be rainbows and sunshine and, and, you know, a great time all the time. You know, Jesus said the same thing. He said, prepare yourself. There will be struggles here on this earth. So there'll be hardships here on this earth. When Jesus called his disciples to go into the uttermost parts of the earth and spread the gospel, he never said, it will be a vacation. As a matter of fact, he called them to do it and then they got martyred. All of them but John died That's how tough the journey was. But he never said that the journey wouldn't be tough. He never said that this trip he's calling you on will be easy. He never said that. 
You see, you're not promised a smooth journey. When Jesus told the disciples, we're crossing the Sea of Galilee because we got to go reach a demoniac on the other side, he never said it's going to be a fun trip because he knew that halfway through it, the storms would come, the waves would toss them, the lightning would flash, the rain would flood them, and they would freak out. He knew that was going to happen, but he, he also knew that he was in control. You see, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says this in verse 13, temptations are common, and the ones that you have, the struggles you have, they're no different from stuff that other people have struggled with. The fear you're dealing with, the temptation you're dealing with, God is faithful. He's not going to allow the temptation to be more than you can withstand. When you're tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. What does that mean? He's saying you don't have to bail out on the trip just because you hit some speed bumps. See, a lot of us, the second the ride starts to get rough, we tuck and roll. We bail out on God. Some of you haven't been in church in decades. Some of you, you only come to church every once in a while because God hurt you. You're mad at him. Things didn't go your way. The journey has sucked. I, I, I hear you. I, I don't know what you've gone through. And you might be like, you don't understand. You're right, I don't. But I know that God loves you. And I know that he brought you to this message because he wanted you to hear. Hey, don't give up on this trip. Keep letting me pull you along. Let me develop you. Let me call you to the next level. He says, hey, when you're tempted, he'll show you a way out so that you can endure, so you can make it. See, you're not promised a smooth journey, but you are promised a safe destination. He says, I guarantee I got you. I guarantee you I'll get you there. It might be a little rocky. It might be a little intense. It may not be the path that you wanted or the speed that you wanted. It might be, not be the temperature or the weather or the passengers that you wanted on it. But he says, I promise that when you get there, I guarantee it'll be the best thing that ever happened to you. He says, when you're done with this life, if you give this life to me, if you give me your life here on earth, that when you die and for all of eternity after, you will be so thankful that you went on that trip with me. Because everything from there on is the greatest it could ever have been because that's what I've got for you. You've got to trust me here. You've got to trust me now. The struggle is we just don't do that. Here's what I want you to do. I want you guys to stand up. I want to tell you about, I don't have time to tell them to you, so I just want to remind you because some of you have feel like the guarantee from God isn't there. He's given you promises to take care of you. Here's just a few references. These verses are just a small tip of the iceberg for the promises that God's given you. These verses say that God's got a, got a specific plan for your life. These verses promise you that in the end, he'll make all of the bad good. These verses promise you that if you trust him as your Lord and Savior, you will actually have an eternity with him. There are so many guarantees from God that if you go on the journey with him, it will be so much better than trying to do your own thing. The question comes down to, he is not going to force you on this trip, but he's inviting you. Will you say yes to him? He told his disciples in the book of Matthew, the very last chapter of Matthew is chapter 28. And the very last verse of chapter 28 is verse 20. This is the last thing that Jesus says. He says, teach my new disciples to obey all the commands. There's that obey again. Teach the next guys after you to do better than you did. Because you guys are a little slow. Teach them to do better. And then remember this. Be sure of this. Don't ever forget this. I am with you always even to the end of the age. Some of you have jumped out of the trip because you got scary. And he said, hey, it doesn't matter how scary it gets, even though, yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll be with you. He also promises, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But the choice is yours on who you're going to take a trip with. 
Are you going to keep doing it solo? Are you going to keep being the, the God of your life? Or are you going to follow him? And if you're thinking, sitting there going, well, I'm already a believer. I've already invited Jesus in. Then why aren't you making any progress? Why is it that he's clearly called you to give more, serve more, love more, and you keep saying, nah, I got my own plan? Why are you not going after what it is he's called you to? Is it because you're a control freak? Is it because it makes you feel a little uncomfortable? You have to answer for yourself, but I pray that you'll go on this journey with me, that we'll both say yes, and that we'll just keep unpacking all that it is that God has for us, that we can grow into what it is he's called us to. Will you pray with me? Bow your head. Close your eyes. I'll pray out loud. You pray quietly. What if as I pray out loud, you just right there say, God, here I am. What if in your heart right now in this moment, you just say, God, forgive me. I'm here and I want to take a trip with you. God, I give you permission to pull me to the next level. God, I give you permission to take me on a journey, take me on a trip that I already know is going to pull me out of my comfort zone that I already know you're gonna challenge me to give up control of my life to you. But God, I recognize in this moment, that's the best thing. God, in this moment right now, as I stand before you, as I pray to you, God, I recognize that there's nothing that this world offers. There's no plan that I have that will bring the fulfillment or the value or the purpose that you can bring. So God, in this moment, I ask right here, right now, would you help me? Would you help every person under the sound of my voice, Lord, to trust you, to follow you? God, would you help us to say yes to this journey that you're calling us on? I, I feel, God, that there's people under the sound of my voice. There's people in this room right now, God, that, Lord, it's just like Abraham. You're, you've asked them to take a scary step to trust you more than they trust their own thoughts, to trust you more than they trust this world, to trust you more than they trust the opinion of people in this world. God, to trust you more than they trust anything else. God, even, even to the place that they can't see where it's leading, they can't see how it's gonna get better, but they know that you're in it. So Lord, would you give them the strength right now? Would you give them the wisdom right now to say yes to you? And Lord, I know there's somebody in this room. God, I know there's somebody that's listening to this message right now that they need you as their savior. They need to say yes to you on the biggest, on the biggest trip, on the biggest question. That is, who's the God of their life? God, there's somebody that right now, they, they, they don't have you as their Lord, as their savior. God, they know you. They know about you but they don't trust you. God, there's somebody that you're, you're, you're pulling them to you right now. They, they know that you want more for them. And so God, I pray that you would be with that person, that man, that woman, that boy, that girl. Lord, that in this moment, they would just simply acknowledge that they need you more than they need anything else. That they would simply say, God, save me, forgive me. You said that if we would just put our faith in you, our trust in you, that you would not only be our Lord and Savior, but you would give us a home in heaven one day when we die. So God, help us all to take that step and then every step afterwards that lets us look more like you. God, would you be with the people in this room right now that as we, we leave here, that we would walk out of here looking a little bit more like Jesus than how we walked in. Thank you, Lord. We ask this, we pray this in your precious and holy name.